This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and it is an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group. That is a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. Remember, like I always tell you, subscribe and follow if you haven't already. And definitely, definitely, definitely leave that review. Um, write, act, like, write it out, especially on Apple Podcasts. I'll put the link in the show notes so you can do it. Um, here's a couple of nice ones that we recently received. One is from Lou Bob 46 uh, Lou Bob says, terrific and fair. I continue to be impressed by the topics and the guests on this podcast. It lives up to its title of respect and fairness. Very engaging. Thank you, Lou Bob. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, I one of my favorite things a lot of folks know is I just continue to be blown away by the folks who come on and have these conversations with me. Like I, everybody, I don't know if everybody knows, but I, I'm not an elected official. I'm not a professional journalist. That's not, that's not my background. So when I started reaching out to all these people um, and we get like David Brooks and the Adam Kinzingers and Daniel Allens and the, you know, just these incredible, you know, roster of people that have joined me. It's just, I, I love talking to them. I love their work. They're typically people whose work I really respect and their contributions to our country, to theology, to the civic conversation uh, has just really blown me away. So getting to talk to them has been the thrill of a lifetime. So I'm glad you're enjoying it, Lou Bob. And I, I do, I, it really means a lot that you take the time to write that review. It's very encouraging. One more we got from Wild Kitty's mom. <laughs> I love that, Wild Kitty's mom. Um, so I wonder if that's her kitty or if that's like maybe what she calls her kids. I don't know, Wild Kitty's mom. Uh, so Wild Kitty's mom said, authentic. I'm glad to have found this podcast, which provides an authentically Christian discussion in the matters of the day. I can no longer bear the far right hate filled speech of so many podcasts professing to be for Christians. I'm grateful for this one. Oh, man, Wild Kitty, you're, like you're talking my language right now. Um, there's so many things I could respond to here, but mostly I'm just grateful for you. Uh, I'm grateful again, that you just took the time to write this. Um, there's a lot of people who are claiming Christianity that really, man, either they're not reading a book or maybe they're reading some different one, <laughs> which maybe we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, so that's a possibility, but yeah, you're right. There's, um, far right hate filled speech of so many podcasts professing to be for Christians. You know, it's interesting. You touched upon that because that's what I wanted to talk about today. The fact is, I am a Christian. Um, I'm not Christ. <laughs> I ain't Jesus, but I am a Christian. And because I'm a Christian, yeah, I, I say that because, like, listen, I am, I am the picture of imperfection <laughs> in all kinds of ways. Um, so I, I could pretend, you know, to be some perfect, you know, um, uh, I don't know, squeaky clean dude. Like, I am who I am. I live out loud. Um, but I, I do believe in a risen Jesus and that that's, that's me. And I, I read my Bible every day and take that word seriously. Um, you know, so I just want to put that out there. Like I ain't perfect. I curse and drink and play poker. I do all these things that people are, well, if you're some Christian, anyway, another conversation for another day. I just say that I am a Christian and because I'm a Christian, this is what I want to talk about. That's why I'm against so many of the words, action, and character exhibited by Donald Trump. But before I get into my reasoning, something needs to be said. There are a lot of Christians I know, people who take their faith seriously, uh, who take their Bible seriously, who've come to different conclusions than I have, who've come to the uncomfortable conclusion for them to vote for Donald Trump. And there's any number of reasons they might arrive at that conclusion, whether it was in 2016, 2020, or even in 2024. Now, I obviously strongly disagree with that conclusion, I disagreed with it in 2016. I disagreed with it in 2020. And at this point in history, there's really no question I disagree with it in 2024. But I only bring this up to say that my, my argument here is not that if you vote for Donald Trump, you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. Um, it, I mean, we have heard it from any number of, of extremist pastors rampaging from their pulpits saying, the other side of that, like you can't vote for a Democrat and, and call yourself a Christian. We've heard plenty of that. 
And I would never say that, obviously, nor would I say that you can't vote for a Republican and call yourself a Christian. So I wouldn't say that either way, what that is, is a form of idolatry, meaning you're putting politics above your theology. You're putting certain politicians over and above God. What we as Christians uh, believe God has said in his word. You're starting with a conclusion that you prefer. You're starting with a conclusion about some political position, and then you're backing scripture into it. You're using scripture to try to justify the position, the preference that you already arrived at. So you, you might recognize this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, the Ten Commandments, <laughs> that, that's a pretty big one for those of us who believe in the authority of the Ten Commandments. And again, I know that there's a lot of folks who are listening that aren't Christians or, you know, have a different view of the Bible than I do. That's cool. I'm not trying to bang you over the head with my Bible. I'm just ta- trying to talk to you from my perspective as a Christian. But thou shalt have, have no other gods before me. <laughs> when you're putting something or someone before God and God's word, and God's word speaks pretty clearly against certain vices, but you're saying, oh, well, that doesn't matter for now, or now's not the time for such things. Let's just say that ain't good. And we're gonna, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the word. All right, why don't we do this? Why don't we start with the Bible, see what it says, and then reckon with how it could apply to the subject at hand. And I'm doing this on the fly, so forgive me if this is um, more improvisational or free we- freewheeling than uh, maybe I typically sound on these things. But I wanted to submit to this experiment that I've been talking about. Um, so I've mentioned her sort of teased about the uh, this um, experiment uh, w- that we can conduct. I, I me- I've mentioned it a few times in the past that I could turn to practically any page of the Bible and it will testify against the words, actions, and character of Donald J. Trump. It's a hunch or maybe um, a hypothesis, okay? But it's a hypothesis that I've developed as someone who's been reading script- uh, scripture daily for over 20 years, going from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and it's starting all over again. And I like I, I grew up studying Torah and all that. Uh, so I, I have some familiar familiarity with the Bible. Um, but like I said, as someone who really believes in this stuff, who believes in the authority of Scripture, let's do what I was suggesting earlier. Start with Scripture rather than my assumptions or prefer, uh, preferences or, or prejudices and see what the word actually says and then reckon with how that applies. So here's what I did. I didn't quite crack open the Bible, let it fall to any page. Uh, mostly because I, I just, I think that's not a great way to really take in scripture. Um, I've always tried to read in bigger chunks so that I can take in more context than just a half a verse here and a half a verse there. Um, that, that method, when you're just like taking little bits and pieces and piecing them together, it's called proof test texting. Um, like, you know, like I was saying before, it's a way of starting with your own prejudice and just looking to put shards, these broken pieces of scripture, like broken shards of glass to make it say what you want it to say. It's the opposite of what we should be doing. So what I try to do is to allow for some randomness while still allowing for contextual thinking. Um, so where kind of uh, randomly landed, I went ahead and read a bunch from three different places in the Hebrew Bible and New Testament. And here's a little spoiler alert, my theory holds. <laughs> Having said all that, why don't I just uh, share with you what I found? The first place I landed on was the second book of Kings. Um, I don't know uh, how often folks who read the, their Bible uh, go through Kings and Chronicles and the histories. Um, but like I said, I just go straight through Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. So I've, I've read through these. But, you know, uh, that's this is the first place in Hebrew Bible where I landed. And this one was kind of a coincidence and, and actually pretty funny, uh, ex- especially because I've had people from my church try to trot out the Trump is like King David or Trump is like Cyrus that they heard from, you know, their Christian leaders with Pat Robertson, uh, James Dobson. Um, oh, let me tell you something. One of the many differences between Trump and King David, and there are endless differences between them, but one of the most scripturally significant differences is that when David was confronted with his sin by the prophet, coincidentally named Nathan, (laughs) um, 
King David fell on his face. He confessed his sin. He grieved in his own depravity and, and begged for forgiveness. Now think of that for a second. That is what King David did when confronted with his sin. Can you ever imagine someone like Donald Trump doing that? The answer is no. So, I mean, the, the, the record can reflect that. This is, this, is not, this is not part of the hypothesis. We, we actually know. Trump, when asked about whether he needs forgiveness, Trump says he doesn't, quote, like to have to ask for forgiveness. And he says, and I am good. I don't do a lot of things that are bad. I try to do nothing that is bad. This, this is like, I'm not making this up. This is literally, I'm unquoting what he said, his own words. He was asked in another interview about the fact that he said he never felt the need to ask for God's forgiveness um, and was asked who he thought Jesus was. Trump's response, I've had great relationships and developed even greater relationships with ministers. We have tremendous support from the clergy. I think I will be doing very well during the election with evangelicals and with Christians. So where does his mind go to? Oh, they love me. They love me. It doesn't go to scripture. It doesn't go to forgiveness. It doesn't go to his own depravity. His own, his own fallenness, it goes to, they love me, uh, I'm very popular, it goes to the polls, it goes, <sighs> this is not falling on your face and asking and begging for forgiveness, confessing one's sin. Um, so don't give me the King David, Donald Trump comparison. Um, so I, uh, I'm opening up my Bible and it's in 2 Kings. Um, if you read a few chapters, you know, <laughs> you know what occurs to me, so I will grant you that maybe Trump really is like some of the kings that are mentioned in the Bible. Because, you know, if you read through the histories, in this case, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, there are a lot of kings who did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Nadab, Jehoram, Jehoahaz, like the kings of Israel, kings of Judah, any number of these guys didn't follow in the ways of the Lord, but followed their own ways. Does that sound familiar? They did evil in the sight of the Lord. And, and there, are some you know, there are some specific places that mention what each of these kings did that was evil. It often had to do with setting up idols or other forms of idolatry. And idolatry broadly being putting other things or practices before God. Remember, thou shalt leave, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Idolatry isn't just about setting up some statue or pillar and bowing down before it as if it was a, a god. Although there was that golden statue of Trump. So, <laughs> so that this is just like, you know, flipping open to Second Kings, like, you know, and hearing the voices of some well-meaning people. Oh, well, what about King David? He wasn't perfect. You know, no, no, no. He he was like some kings, but not the kings you're talking about. Um, but more broadly speaking, I'll, I'm asking what's evil in the sight of the Lord, not just these stories of, of bowing down and worshiping, you know, golden trumps or uh, <laughs> golden idols. Um, thinking of it that way sort of separates us from our own culpability, if you will. So what is it? What does it actually mean to do evil in the sight of the Lord? And just just if we stay in the same collection, uh, the, the the Bible, stay in this, you know, stay in Scripture, we can get a sense of what's meant by that within the same collection. Um, there are plenty of places in the Bible that that where it espouses certain virtues, like the, the fa famous passage known as the fruit of the Spirit, um, as well as where the Bible goes into what we think of as vices or or sins, if you will. But there's one passage I found uh, really helpful on on this subject, because it, it really hits a nail on the head in terms of what does it mean to do evil in the sight of the Lord? I, and I've quoted from uh, some of this passage before, which also happens to be uh, from the Hebrew, Bi Hebrew Bible. It says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. I'm quoting from, um, uh, I'm quoting from scripture now. Uh, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict, <laughs> who stirs up conflict in the community. So there you have it. I mean, I, do I need to go through each of these things? 
let me back up. There's a funny story about this, uh, this particular passage, by the way. One, one time, this other Christian dude was uh, trying to, as he put it, exhort me uh, about my supposed sin of being critical of Donald Trump. Um, he was really basically just trying to take me down. And he sends me one half of one of these verses, the part about stirring up conflict in a community. He was basically saying that the Lord hates me because I wasn't towing the company line, the, the supposed Christian line, when it came to the social and political positions, you know, of, of liking Trump and hating who Trump hated and, and all that, that I was sowing division in the church. So my first thought went to how many atrocities were swept under the rug using this very same language. That, that was the first thing I thought of, honestly, uh, because I'm so from, I, I've become increasingly familiar with this, this logic, wh whether it's uh, priests or pastors, in, like present day, who are serial sexual predators, um, that whether it's the Catholic Church or the Southern Baptist Convention, they refuse to do anything about this because the sin isn't so much about the, uh, about the victims, the victims who've been abused and raped, uh, who, whose lives have been ruined. It, it, in this logic, the supposed sin is bringing it up because that would be stirring up conflict. So anyway, this dude uh, quotes this little shard of scripture, like a, a broken piece of glass he's trying to cut me with. But I'm like, I, I didn't contend with him about the SBC and the Catholic Church. Um, what I did say, what I, what, what I did say was, it might be good to read just a little more sport. <laughs> Like, let's actually read the passage and not just the half of a verse that you wanted to use to bang me over the head with. Because we don't even have to read the whole chapter in this case. Let's just read the whole passage or read the, read the sentence, the beginning of the sentence, and see what it's actually saying. Not the handful of words you thought served your purpose. Let's see what it actually says. And what do you know? God's word actually says something altogether different than what you're trying to bang me over the head with. In fact, it's, in a lot of ways, it's just the opposite. As we go through the whole uh, thought, what, what does it say? That God hates haughty eyes. Haughty, be, haughty being like proud or pridefulness. Sound familiar? That God hates a lying tongue. Someone who lies all the time. Who could we possibly be referring to? Who might be an example of that? That God hates a heart that devises wicked schemes. Like, I don't know, having, a sec having sex with a porn star while your wife is home nursing your newborn son and then trying to pay off that porn star to keep her mouth shut about it? That sounds like a wicked scheme of pressuring election workers to make up votes that weren't cast or other election workers to break into election machines and try to reverse uh, the actual results of that election or hold on to material that doesn't belong to you even after you've been asked for them and then lie about whether you have them? And then, and then obstruct a, a, a officials who are trying to obtain those materials? I mean, I, I could go on and on. But if, if this is a report card on these six things, no, these seven the Lord hates, the Donald's not doing very well. Not at all. And again, like, I ain't Jesus. I'm just a Christian. I know I don't do well on these things either. But when I'm confronted with it, uh, not, not by some dude who's like, you know, ha, you know who has some political agenda, who, who, who says, I, I'm not, uh, you know, towing the company line. But, you know, w when I have a conflict, for example, with my wife, and I haven't treated her with the uh, dignity, with the fruit of the spirit that she deserves as another human being, you know, that I got it or with my kids, when I, I lose, sometimes I lose my, you know, I lose my shit, I'll just say it. I, like I said, I curse and I drink and I play poker, you know, then then when I'm confronted with it, then yeah, I want to I want to ask for forgiveness. And I want to try to uh, be in the process of being coming more godly. Um, so I'm not trying to uh, pretend here that I'm some innocent dove, you know, some uh, some innocent angel. But what we're talking about is Donald freaking Trump. So, you know, what, how's Donald doing on this? I'll read it again. I'll read the whole passage again. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes or prideful, you know, pridefulness, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Um, he's, he's failing 
if we look at this as a report card, he's failing miserably. So let's just be candid about all this. When you go down the six, these the, uh, seven things the Lord hates, and I'm not, uh, I'm not messing up the, that's how it's, it's like a poetic um, tactic, if you will, a poetic tool. No, these seven the Lord hates. Donald Trump is the very picture of what the Lord hates. So yeah, maybe Trump is like uh, some of the things that are mentioned in scripture, just not the ones that Paula White would have us think. And as a Christian, as a Christian, this leads me to the conviction that I cannot support the words, actions, and character of Donald Trump. But before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money. <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Meza. George runs Meza Wealth Management. And with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me. He knows my family. And I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals, and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which by the way, could change up from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Meza and Meza Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mezawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mezawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. So, let's keep going with this experiment. It's funny, I just quoted from Proverbs, because another place I ended up flipping to was Proverbs 10. So, I, I won't be as long-winded on these next couple, because I, I think in a lot of ways they speak for themselves. Proverbs 10 had all kinds of wisdom. Like, uh, verse 2, ill-gotten gains do not benefit. <laughs> ill-gotten gain that i mean that should be the day if he's gonna write and sell another book don't be selling no bibles man sell sell a book that's titled ill-gotten gains because that that's this whole dude's freaking history going back to like how he ruined the usfl you know or before that his time trying to please his his dad in in uh you know in queens uh we go to verse six the mouth of the wicked conceals violence verse 12 hatred stirs up strife but love covers all offenses would you ever say again i'm not talking about people who support him i'm talking about donald trump so if you're listening to this and you think i'm talking about you because you are favorable to donald trump i'm not talking about you i'm talking about donald trump and i'm talking about what the bible says and what the bible says and as we apply it and as we think through who we are supporting let's reckon with this. Let's deal with what scripture says. Proverbs 10, verse 12, hatred stirs up strife. Does hatred and the strife that uh, the, this individual stirs up describe Donald Trump? Or would you think, when you think of Donald Trump, do you think of love and how his love, loving nature covers all offenses? Come on! You, you, you know, even, even his biggest supporters, you, you can't look me in the eye and tell me that that's you know, that, that he's on the wrong side of that. We could go just a couple more verses down. Verse 14, with the mouth of the foolish, ruin is at hand. Everything tr Donald Trump has touched dies, as Stuart Stevens has said. <laughs> verses uh, 17 through 19, one who ignores a rebuke goes astray. Like I was saying before, the comparison between him and, and King David. Uh, one who conceals hatred has lying lips. And one who spreads slander is a fool. When there are many words, wrongdoing is unavoidable. Keep, keep on going. Verse 23, doing wickedness is like sport to a fool. You know, the only time I, the dude looks like he's having fun is when he's doing wickedness. He's, he's having fun. Like he doesn't smile. He doesn't laugh 
the way we laugh at funny things, he laughs out of a sense of cruelty. Think about that. Have you ever seen him laugh? Have you ever seen him smile? Except when there's a sense of hatred and, 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 and cruelty? I, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong about that, but like that, that's one of, I don't know, it's, it's something I've noticed over the years in, in watching uh, this individual's public, uh, what, what's been recorded publicly. Um, you know, and, and don't start with me. Yeah, you don't know his heart. We have so much on the record from him. You can't, you can't tell me that it's all just a, a show. You know, we've, we've, we've all been subjected to it. You don't know what's in his heart. Stop. Just stop. You're, 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 making, you're making excuses for just the unexcusable. Okay? There's plenty that we have on the record. The words, actions, and character. The words, actions, and character. That's what I'm talking about. So going forward, we can look at the New Testament. Um, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, it just, it ha of the four Gospels, my favorite is John, because it's just, for me, it's like the most theologically robust. It reminds me the most of Torah. Um, there's so much in there that I, I love. So it happened to be John. Um, and it was the, it was an event that is recorded in all four gospels, I think. Uh, but this one was where Jesus turns over the tables in the temple. Uh, and this is in verse 13. Is, I think it is John 2. Um, I just, sorry, I just copied and pasted what I happened upon. Um, it says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts both sheep and cattle he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables to those who sold doves he said get these out of here stop turning my father's house into a market uh, his disciples remembered that it is written zeal for your house will consume me um so <laughs> You really don't got to go too far to figure this one out. Uh, now, here, here's the thing. This this, this passage uh, and its, its related passages in the other Gospels have been hijacked, but not in context. Uh, so there's this, um, we talked about with uh, Tim Alberta, the Reawaken America tour, the, the, the one where they have these speakers, the Mike Lindell, the, the MyPillow guy, and Alex Jones, and... Um, the, the, some of these other speakers, the, a couple of the Trump spawns, uh, Don Jr. and um, what's his name, Eric, <laughs> which is how Donald probably refers to Eric. What's his name, Eric? <laughs> Sorry, that was that was unkind. Uh, but uh, yes, but they go to these things, um, given stage at churches around the country for what? The, I mean, so let me back up for a second. So if you go to the Reawaken America tour um, website, they're selling stuff. Um, they're selling. And one of the things that they're selling is the we Reawaken America tour Bible <laughs> for 40 bucks. But it starts with this. The sales pitch to buy their version of the Bible starts with, um, I forgot the dude's name. I guess it's the dude who's behind the Reawaken America tour. It starts with, and I quote, my thesis, the world needs to be taught about the table flipping Jesus. Oh, do tell. <laughs> like, are we not going to read the rest of what the, the passage is about? Are we just going to pretend and submit to your thought that there was a table flipping Jesus? Well, what was he flipping tables for? It might have been for people selling $40 Bibles with their names on it. That might have been it. You know, now, you know, I'm, I'm making poetic license to, to, to make that connection. But this is literally, this is literally what Jesus was, was so pissed about. You know, so yeah. What, what was remarkable about that little uh, drama is that, number one, Jesus didn't get, like, D Jesus didn't flip tables all the time. This was a unique moment. But, but what's important is, what was he so upset about? What was he protesting against? That what was remarkable is how unique of an incident this was. But specifically, you just got to read it. Like, whenever somebody confronts me with a, a little piece of scripture, my thesis, the world needs to be taught about the table flipping Jesus. Okay, let's keep reading. That is a good way to start when it comes to the Bible. Let's keep reading. What does the Bible actually say? He was in the temple courts. He found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, other, others sitting at tables exchanging money. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
Because why? They were doing business and they, they, were, they were turning his father's house into a market. Kind of like a $60 Trump Bible. Trump holding up a Bible he's probably never cracked open, selling it for 60 bucks. Why? Because it has the Declaration of Independence in it? It has a constitution in it? That's, those are two things. Like, listen, I love me some constitution. I love me some Declaration of Independence. But, the, but those two things are good things. It doesn't have a place in... I might get myself into trouble here, but those two things do not belong together. They're two separate things. And we need to keep them separate. My point is that I just, the, some New Testament scripture that I flipped to, it happened to be this incident. And this incident has not, it hasn't been taken in context. It's just this, um, this excuse that people have been using to engage in violence, to engage in the violence that occurred, for example, on January 6th. That's, that's not the proper use of this. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. You know, selling $60 Bibles that, that Trump is selling. And if anything, this passage is, is, is warning us against that. You know, violently clearing out a demonstration uh, with the military behind him so that he could cross the street and hold a Bible upside down in front of a church. That is what Jesus was clearing out. That's what I'm talking about. Jesus was clearing out the guys who were selling $60 Bibles. The equivalent of that, not literally, figuratively, of course. You know, Jesus was clearing out these guys who were branding this tour and using the language of the Bible, not as it's meant to be used, but in order to vest their, their, their events with some sort of elevated cause that they have God on their side. That, no, these types of tactics are behind some of the worst atrocities throughout history. So it is interesting that I ended up flipping to that, that passage in John 2. All that to say that my theory holds, <laughs> that I could flip to practically any page of the Bible, and it testifies against the words, actions, and character of Donald Trump. So let me just wrap up by saying, if you are still listening, I'd really like to know what you think. What I'm most interested in is how to do this whole thing better. Uh, I, I just, I don't want to give up on reaching across our differences. Even if you find some of what I said really offensive to you. Uh, again, I'm going to say, uh, say it one more time, just for, just to make sure you heard me. I'm not talking about people who've come to the difficult c conclusion that they're going to vote for Trump again. Like, I'm not talking about you. I, I went through this exercise because I'm talking specifically about Donald Trump. I'm not projecting that onto all those who've ended up voting for him in 2016, 2020, or probably will again in 2024. I hope you'll reconsider. Um, what this is all about is just me sharing the understanding, my, my reasoning behind why I am against the words, actions, and character of Donald Trump because I'm a Christian. I, the last time we talked about it, because I'm a conservative. So, Part of the reason I went through it is because I don't want uh, the I don't want the subject to be hijacked by those who who claim exclusive domain of Christianity and say if you're a Christian you'll vote for Don. No, 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 no. I read me some Bible. I, I I I take very seriously what it says in there. And if you well, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say if you take it seriously too, you'll come to this conclusion. You can come to whatever conclusion you want. But I'm not going to let the entire conversation be dominated by those who are screaming from their pulpits uh, and saying, you can't possibly think this way. No, no, no. Let's just read the Bible. If you want to give me some scripture, prove me wrong. OK, like the dude try to use the scripture of, you know, being divisive or whatever. But like, look, dude. All right, I'll take it. But let's read. Let's keep reading. All right. And when we keep reading, it's not going to the, the, the report card is not going to come come back looking too good for your guy. All right. So that's why I went through this exercise is because I am a Christian and that is why I am anti-Trump. I am against, I, I shouldn't even say anti-Trump. I anti the words, actually the character of Donald Trump. That's specifically what it's about. So again, I want to keep on trying to do this. Uh, I, I am interested in your thoughts. If you have, if you're still bothering to listen, um, 
because I, I want to figure out how to do it better. Sometimes it, we're going to passionately disagree. Um, but I think we could figure out how to have more meaningful conversations, even if they're tough with folks that aren't like me, have different views from me. I just want to figure out how to do it better, but we're going to do it. You know, I am going to crack open that Bible. If you're going to give me like this broken shard, broken piece of glass and try to throw it at me and tell me that, that that's what scripture says. All right, let's take a look at scripture, see what it says. So far, this experiment just proved, you know, I, I didn't arrive at that point first. I flip through the Bible. I don't flip through it. I read it seriously, chunks of it at a time every day. And I'm thinking to myself, man, Bible couldn't be more clear. Scripture couldn't be more clear. So I am anti-Trump because I am a Christian. Here's one. There's a lot of people who say they're Christians out there who are using the broken pieces of glass version of, of Scripture, little pieces here, little pieces there, to say what they want it to say, not deriving it from the Bible and drawing their conclusions from there, but what they want first and trying to back scripture into it. I'm doing just the opposite. So I'll just wind it down there. Uh, as <laughs> Sorry, I got heated today because uh, this is really important to me. So as always, if you dig what we're doing here, remember to follow the show, write that review, tell a friend about talking politics and religion without killing each other. We are easy to recommend. Just tell your friends to go to their favorite podcast app type in without killing each other without the g killing is without the g without killing each other you'll find our big purple logo uh, or you can find me online and engage with me i'm at Corey s nathan at c-o-r-e-y s is in scott n-a-t-h-a-n at c-o-r-e-y-s n-a-t-h-a-n at Corey s nathan now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness ah, gosh i probably wasn't gentle today and respect i did do it respectfully though even though I was I was passionate, maybe piss some people off again. But uh, go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. <laughs>